Hello and welcome to the NDTV Dialogues, a conversation of ideas. This week we have a very special edition coming to you from San Francisco, where I'm joined by Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal. Mr. Goyal, you've had a packed schedule in the United States, the two big economic meetings happening, and you're here for the idea of India and in the sense that India is the place to be. What's been the big message? Because of course, APEC, India is not a member of it, but you're here as a guest. India has been invited for the first time. What is the big message you're giving? Well, I think very clearly, the world is looking at India and the way India's leadership has emerged over the last few years. Prime Minister Narendra Modi recognized today as uh, truly a world leader of substance, somebody people respect immensely, look up to his leadership is reflected in our engagements uh, at the APEC, at IPEF. They are all looking up to India to contribute in a big way for a safe, secure Indo-Pacific region. They are all looking at India as the growth engine of the world economy. And uh, my engagements with different leaders here, my meetings with my counterparts, with industry, captains of industry, all demonstrate very clearly the excitement about working with India, working in India, and the expectations that uh, are today quite large from the India story. It's interesting because, of course, uh, India isn't a part of APEC, yet we've been invited for the first time. Do you think India needs to be part of APEC sooner rather than later? And, of course, the geopolitics, given that President Xi has come to the U.S. after five years to attend this uh, uh, summit, you've said that the India-US relationship has nothing to do with what uh, many say is the China plus one strategy of the United States. I'm very convinced that today India stands on its own feet. Uh, uh, India is a compelling case for investment. It's a compelling partnership based on trust, which we are forging with different countries. And uh, while we are now very actively engaged with IPEF, we haven't applied our mind to joining up with APEC at the present moment. But it's been nice to be formally invited. Prime Minister Modi would have come, but for the uh, elections going on in India. Uh, but clearly, the respect that India is getting from uh, the United States of America, from their leaders, from the other countries around the world, uh, reflects the growing importance of uh, India as a country and the huge uh, adulation, I can say, that I see amongst the leaders when they talk about Prime Minister Modi. How closely uh, is India watching the meeting which just happened with President Xi and President Biden? And what would you say about this China plus one strategy? Do you agree with it at all? Well, that's an internal uh, matter between the US and China. And uh, uh, we wish them well. We have uh, no reason to uh, watch that meeting, as you're saying. But more importantly, across the world, there is a recognition that there should be more resilient supply chains. Across the world, businesses are concerned about their experiences of the recent past. They are also very concerned about uh, transparency, about uh, opaque business practices, about and the big value that democracy brings to the table. Mm -hmm. In all those respects, and when you have an overlay of uh, the cost of doing business, where India today stands out as a very, very uh, attractive destination, I think India will be an important partner in supply chains, more for the trust that they have in our abilities. Uh, just uh, before this uh, interview, I had a conversation with a large semiconductor company who has big operations in India. And uh, he told me that they're almost like an Indian company now. They have 15,000 highly qualified, highly paid engineers working in India, doing cutting edge technology work, R&D work, innovation, design. And they're super excited about it. They have aggressive plans to grow the business there. So for American companies, it's made in India because all the, so many of the engineers are from India. But you visited the Tesla factory, and I think you made that point that you were excited to see that the number of components they import from India is going to double. You were excited to see the number of Indian engineers there. But the big question, Bloomberg just reported, 
that India is considering uh, perhaps a tax holiday or tax cuts on fully assembled electric vehicles to come in for the first five years. Any well, confirmation of that? Please don't buy the stories that you see on uh, news channels That's why I'm news asking media you. all the time. Uh, my visit was primarily around meeting uh, the Tesla team, uh, many of whom are Indians and have done us proud. Uh, it was also to discuss their plans about an increasing India element in their supply chain and I, I'm really immensely pleased at their plans to double their imports from India and going forward they're really looking at very aggressive plans along with uh, reputed auto component manufacturers in India. Uh, there are many other discussions uh, which are always uh, there in the, on the table. But for the present, the meeting was focused on uh, what we can do to be an important element of their supply chain. But this is actually a proposal made by Elon Musk for early in 2021 that give us some kind of tax holiday and incentive to come in. Is that something the government will consider well, seriously? Very clearly, we would like to see a lot more happening in the electric uh, vehicle uh, ecosystem in India. You can see that we are adopting EVs very fast. The two-wheeler industry, for example, is seeing nearly 40% of two-wheelers being sold in India being electric. Going forward, uh, I, I think uh, on commercial vehicles, whether it's buses, trucks, or even passenger cabs, it's a, it's a no-brainer to use electric vehicles. It's mm -hmm. much more economical and eco-friendly. Yes. On passenger vehicles, I think the battery costs are a deterrent, and we are seeing that rapidly uh, correcting itself. And I, I do think that in the years ahead, the EV ecosystem in India is going to grow rapidly. Probably the fastest ramp up you'll see in the next 10 years mm -hmm. of electric vehicles will happen in India. So it, I, I suspect all the countries around the world would like to come to India. We have uh, good domestic manufacturing capability on electric vehicles uh, already. Government has bought a lot of electric vehicles also. I see them all over the place uh, in the private sector. So you're not willing to go down that road of tax cuts? You're not, think, you're, you're not thinking of that yet because you think our market is big enough? I think uh, we'll talk to all the players and uh, have a conversation with uh, other electric vehicle manufacturers both in India and across the world mm -hmm. and come up with a cogent uh, policy which will support the electric vehicle ecosystem. Mm -hmm. My own sense is uh, electric vehicles have come to stay. They are very good for us in terms of our environment uh, efforts to clean up the environment, our fight against climate change, our uh, commitments to reduce import of crude oil which will significantly help the Indian economy. Yes. So it's, it's a multifarious benefit that we get from the electric uh, vehicle or, uh, ecosystem. Okay. And just imagine if, if uh, we cut down the $100 billion of oil imports into the country and uh, we would have a trade surplus every year exactly. and India would be a growth story like unparalleled in history. You know, and uh, one interesting aspect has been because so often geopolitics takes matters really out of any country's planning. So we've seen that with the uh, ban on the export of rice because of what happened in Ukraine. Now you've got what's happening in Israel and Palestine. How worried are you about looking because of India's plan to become the third largest economy in a few years? How do you think these global conflicts are actually impacting India? And again, we talk about the voice of the global south, but India has differed quite significantly on the view on the conflict from many other countries of the global south. Uh, at the outset, in terms of our growth trajectory, I think Prime Minister Modi has steered the Indian economy so beautifully, strengthening the macroeconomic fundamentals, creating a whole country of 140 crore aspirational Indians looking for a better quality of life, and the deep focus on infrastructure development. This trinity of uh, actions is uh, something which has helped India be poised for probably three or four decades of high growth rates. So in terms of India becoming the third largest economy, I, I don't think it will be more than three or four years down the road. Mm -hmm. So when Prime Minister Modi guarantees that in this third term, India will be the third largest economy, I think it's a no-brainer. It's 100% there. We will make it happen. And his decisive leadership, his commitment to growth, his commitment to 
uh, encouraging investments in India is, is uh, recognized and respected across the world today. Uh, today I met uh, many large investors running some of the world's largest investment uh, funds mm -hmm. and uh, their investment plans are huge into the country. Oh. I in fact threw a couple of numbers at one or two of those companies and every, every case they said no this is not our ambition it's much bigger. So I think India is poised to get, in, get there to the third largest economy and then beyond. On your other point about uh, uh, the geopolitical situation, first of all, let me clarify, any of our bans are not because we are unable to meet the needs of others. Mm -hmm. It's just to ensure that the greed of some unscrupulous business persons or traders does not cause international prices to go crazily high. So, in effect, our bans are more to keep prices both in India and in other less developed countries or emerging markets stable. Mm -hmm. We do provide uh, rice or other food grains to all our friendly countries, to all our uh, deserving uh, partners, particularly the less developed countries, which is at affordable prices and helps them maintain price stability. So, most more cases than not are restrictions on export are directed towards channelizing the available uh, material or food grains mm -hmm. for global good rather than allowing it to become a matter of uh, profiteering by certain businesses. And to your third point about our views on the geopolitical situation, I think we, are, we have great clarity in our thinking. Prime Minister Modi is on record to condemn terrorism in all its form anywhere in the world. And India has suffered from terrorism for years. We have been at the receiving end. I mean, almost until uh, we removed Article 370 and 35A from the statute uh, in Kashmir, uh, we would have terrorism rearing its head on a daily basis. It's only in the last four, four and a half years that we've finally found peace in Kashmir except for that sporadic incident. Having said that, I think we believe in the two-nation theory. We believe there should be a cessation of hostilities. We have supported the last UN resolution. Mm -hmm. And India has had a very consistent stand. A, against terrorism. B, against peaceful coexistence. Dialogue and diplomacy is the way forward. War can never be a solution. The interesting point you made on Prime Minister Mozi's guarantees for the third term of uh, this government. Well, the opposition would say that your this is perhaps hubris already predicting a result too early and the opposition charge would be that the Modi government or ministers are making the poor get poorer and the rich get richer and this is part of that narrative. How do you think this is going to play out at a time when you're also going to be hitting election season almost as soon as you land in Delhi? First of all, it's not uh, at all arrogance or hubris as uh, you mentioned. Uh, it's realism and Prime Minister Modi's popularity is there for everyone to see. Uh, if you look back at 2018, I'm on record on more than one occasion. And that was not just an uh, astrological prediction. I remember you did call it out. Uh, it was based on the love and affection we saw in the people we met. It was based on the extensive surveys that had been done. And uh, clearly, even when you go out there uh, into the hinterland, into the villages of India, into the remotest corners uh, of the country, the adulation, the love, the affection, the respect that Prime Minister Modi commands, the, the expectations, the positivity that is generated the moment they find out that you are a member of his team is truly heartwarming. And uh, if at all anybody is trying to spread the narrative of uh, the poor getting poorer, it's pretty silly because I think never before in India's history has anybody bothered to care for the poor as much as Prime Minister the Modi in the food, last night. The free food, green, I'm sorry, cross. look at every element of his work, whether it was the Jandhan Mobile Aadhaar Trinity, which helped us get uh, uh, transfer of benefits to the poor directly, mm -hmm. without middlemen, without the Rajiv Gandhi days, where 15% would reach the poor, and 85% would go to congressmen and middlemen and uh, into corruption by the Congress leaders. I think uh, we are very proud that we have sp sent almost 30 lakh crores to the people of India directly into their bank account.
with not a single instance of corruption or uh, any leakage in the system. We are very proud that something which should have happened maybe 75 years ago has happened in Mr. Modi's term that every single home has a toilet, every home is connected with electricity, every corner of the country has digital connectivity, something you don't even find in the United States, as good as you can find yeah, in the India. Signal is much worse. Water is reaching every home through a tap, half of the country done, the other half will be finished in another couple of years. But I'm I, no, I just wanted to ask you on that because I know, of course, how politically attuned you are even while you're sitting here because, of course, you're the leader in the Rajya Sabha. You've got a winter session coming up soon. And also Madhya Pradesh voting a key state for the BJP. Just going so far by opinion poll surveys on news channels that the expectation seems to be of pollsters or political analysts that the BJP is losing Madhya Pradesh, losing Chhattisgarh, winning Rajasthan. Mizoram is unclear and Telangana, it's not the BGP which is giving the fight, but the Congress to the BRS. Well, I think very clearly uh, what we see on the ground, what I have seen on television or on uh, X, formerly Twitter, uh, lends me to believe that uh, the tide has turned in Chhattisgarh and we are very, very clearly ahead of the Congress in Chhattisgarh. Madhya Pradesh, even before I left India, was very clearly coming back to the BJP. Uh, I myself have had extensive visits both in Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. Rajasthan is looking to be a one-sided affair. We are doing extremely well in Rajasthan. Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh are poised to give us a BJP government. Telangana is pretty far off into the future. Uh, like voting is on the 30th. I have had only one or two visits to Telangana. As I get back and uh, connect more with the ground and with the people, I'll probably get a better sense of what's happening, but clearly the three states uh, which which uh, I have been uh, able to go and uh, campaign in and where I have experienced firsthand the mood on the ground are positively getting the BJP government back. Chhattisgarh initially didn't look like uh, we were in the race, but it's probably one of the fastest turnaround in an election that I have seen where it swung uh, significantly in our favor. Well, I'll play this back after the results, but just to ask why Most this welcome. why the state center dichotomy? Because of course, remember five years ago, the BGP actually lost these states and yet came back with a record margin in the Lok Sabha elections. Why is there this state center dichotomy? The Karnataka loss, do you think that has led to some message that you can vote differently in the states and differently in Lok Sabha in the larger context? It's always happened in politics. So very often by elections, for example, they give a different result from what the mood of the nation is. Very often, uh, if you look back at 2018 also, the predictions were made after we lost all the elections. It was very clear that people were uh, looking up to Mr. Modi to give decisive, strong leadership, to get a corruption-free India in place. Women empowerment has been very much a part of his uh, agenda all through the nine, nine and a half years of government. And the delivery of uh, empowerment, to the last man, to everybody in the country without discrimination. Everybody, irrespective of caste, creed, religion, whether they voted for the BJP or not. Just to ask what I think really was interesting, the surprise the BJP threw when many MPs are actually back there fighting assembly elections. Are many ministers from the Rajya Sabha going to be fighting elections? Are you going to be fighting an election in 24? I think that's for the party to decide. This is the strength of the BJP. We are a party of uh, Karikartas. We all work for the party with a mission. And for us, it's not about uh, the role you are in today. It's a commitment to the nation. It's a commitment to our party. And uh, whatever decision the leadership takes, I think we all are a part of that uh, decision as uh, loyal soldiers of the party. So I'm really proud that some of our MPs, some of our ministers are also fighting the state elections. It clearly demonstrates to the country and to the people of uh, these states that this is a party where power is not the end game, service is paramount. So for American companies, it's made in India because all the, so many of the engineers are from India. But you visited the Tesla factory and I think you made that point that you were excited to see that the number of components they import from India is going to double. You were excited to see the number of Indian engineers there. But the big question, Bloomberg just reported, 
that India is considering uh, perhaps a tax holiday or tax cuts on fully assembled electric vehicles to come in for the first five years. Any well, confirmation of that? Please don't buy the stories that you see on uh, news channels That's or why news I'm asking media you. all the time. Uh, my visit was primarily around meeting uh, the Tesla team, uh, many of whom are Indians and have done us proud. Uh, it was also to discuss their plans about an increasing India element in their supply chain and I, I'm really immensely pleased at their plans to double their imports from India and going forward they're really looking at very aggressive plans along with uh, reputed auto component manufacturers in India. Uh, there are many other discussions uh, which are always uh, there in the, on the table. But for the present, the meeting was focused on uh, what we can do to be an important element of their supply chain. But this is actually a proposal made by Elon Musk for early in 2021 that give us some kind of tax holiday and incentive to come in. Is that something the government will consider well, seriously? Very clearly, we would like to see a lot more happening in the electric uh, vehicle uh, ecosystem in India. You can see that we are adopting EVs very fast. The two-wheeler industry, for example, is seeing nearly 40% of two-wheelers being sold in India being electric. Going forward, uh, I, I think uh, on commercial vehicles, whether it's buses, trucks, or even passenger cabs, it's a, it's a no-brainer to use electric vehicles. It's mm -hmm. much more economical and eco-friendly. Yes. On passenger vehicles, I think the battery costs are a deterrent, and we are seeing that rapidly uh, correcting itself. And I, I do think that in the years ahead, the EV ecosystem in India is going to grow rapidly. Probably the fastest ramp up you'll see in the next 10 years mm -hmm. of electric vehicles will happen in India. So it, I, I suspect all the countries around the world would like to come to India. We have uh, good domestic manufacturing capability on electric vehicles uh, already. Government has bought a lot of electric vehicles also. I see them all over the place uh, in the private sector. So you're not willing to go down that road of tax cuts? You're not, think, you know, you're not thinking of that yet because you think our market is big enough? I think uh, we'll talk to all the players and uh, have a conversation with uh, other electric vehicle manufacturers both in India and across the world mm -hmm. and come up with a cogent uh, policy which will support the electric vehicle ecosystem. Mm -hmm. My own sense is uh, electric vehicles have come to stay. They are very good for us in terms of our environment uh, efforts to clean up the environment our fight against climate change, our uh, commitments to reduce import of crude oil, which will significantly help the Indian economy. Yes. So it's, it's a multifarious benefit that we get from the electric uh, vehicle or, uh, ecosystem. Okay. And just imagine if, if uh, we cut down the $100 billion of oil imports into the country, and uh, we would have a trade surplus every year. Exactly. And India would be a growth story like unparalleled in history.